uh, start by uh, sharing screen and just give you a, a quick picture of, of this thing and, and describe to you what it is. Okay, so are, are you guys seeing my screen? Yeah, we can see it. Yep. Great. So here's just a real quick glimpse of the vehicle. What this is, is a wind powered vehicle that's designed to go directly downwind faster than the wind, uh, steady state. And, uh, you know, it's it's actually very simple. Uh, the analysis is very simple, but the, the concept is pretty counterintuitive. So a lot of folks uh, claim that it, it can't be done in steady state. And they have a lot of theories as to, you know, what's really happening. It's, the, the, the wind is briefly dropping and the car is continuing. But in fact, we set a record going 2.8 times the wind speed and accelerating, you know, during that entire uh, stretch. Um, so this particular video is interesting in that it was taken by uh, a guy named Richard Jenkins. Richard had set the the overall land uh, wind powered speed record at 126 miles an hour. And it was after this that I learned that Richard was absolutely certain that this couldn't work. So this video is Richard seeing for the first time that it, it did uh, what it was claimed to. And so that that's me driving the uh, silly vehicle. Um, so the, you know, the way it started, let me, um, let me see if I can get back to camera. So the, the way, the way this whole thing started was, uh, that somebody had a friend, uh, had asked me whether sailboats could tack downwind in a way that their downwind velocity, their velocity made good downwind is faster than the wind. You know, he knew as, as I think we all do that sailboats can go faster than the wind, but he wondered whether the downwind component uh, could be faster than the wind. Um, and, you know, somewhat to my embarrassment, since I've been sailing most of my life and I'm an aerospace engineer, I, I didn't know the answer to that. Um, I should have known, at, back at that time, that was around 2006. And at that time, uh, I don't know that there were sailboats doing it regularly. Nowadays, if you look at things like the America's Cup competitors, they go, uh, they, they do tack downwind. When they go on a downwind run, they never run wing and wing. They never run straight downwind. Instead, they, they tack because they can go quite a, get, quite a bit faster and they can actually beat a, like a free floating balloon to the downwind destination by tacking. Um, what was true at the time, of course, is that land yachts and, and ice boats certainly could go downwind faster than the wind as long as they were tacking downwind. Um, but as I said, I didn't know the answer to this question. So what I did is, uh, and I'm going to share my uh, desktop again. Um, I I told him that I would uh, do a little analysis and and see whether it should be possible or not. And I was a little surprised uh, to learn that uh, it it absolutely is possible. There was no theoretical uh, reason that it shouldn't be done. Um, let me see if I can. You know what? I'm 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 kind of out of order. I'm gonna come. I'll I'll, I'll come back to that. But um, what what I what I did actually do was to to do uh, a little vector analysis, which I'm gonna I'll, I'll touch on in a little bit. That shows that a sailboat should be able to to do that. Um, let me. So one, one thing I, I want to uh, hit on here real quick is the, the notion of glide ratio. Uh, so if you look at a, a wing uh, or a sail or a propeller blade or a keel uh, for a sailboat down in the water, um, most any of those things can broadly be uh, characterized by, their performance can be characterized with their lift and drag. Uh, so typically, uh, any reasonable wing will have a much higher lift than drag. The lift to drag ratio, uh, you know, might be 20 on a, on a sailplane, you can have 50 or more uh, glide ratio. And it turns out the glide ratio is uh, the same as the lift to drag ratio. Um, it's useful to know that lift is always defined as being perpendicular to the flight path, and drag is 
uh, along the flight path uh, against your direction of travel. The, in this case, you can see that the lift and drag uh, add together vectorally to, uh, to oppose gravity. So here you have a, an aircraft um, following a glide path at steady state, uh, just showing the lift, the drag, and, and the gravity. Those are all the forces involved, and that will come into play on, on this thing. Uh, I should say that um, my objective today is to answer, is to, is to address whatever you guys want addressed. So I would encourage, if I'm going off in, in uninteresting directions or confusing people or whatever, uh, jump in, ask questions, and, and you know, put me on track. Um, so one, one thing we should talk about is, another thing we should talk about is um, Galilean relativity or Galilean invariance. And that's the, the concept that if there's no preferred inertial frame, um, if I am in the back of a truck going down the highway at 60 miles an hour, um, I can, or, or in the galley of a ship, that's moving along at some velocity, I can play a game of tennis or I can bowl or jog or run or, you know, do whatever I want. And there's actually no way to know that I'm moving because in, in point of fact, um, I'm not moving in any real sense any more than I am in any other frame. I mean, on the, on the surface of the earth, you know, if I'm at the equator, we're going about a thousand miles an hour as the, as the earth turns and we're going, I don't remember, 67,000 miles an hour as the earth goes around the sun and so forth. All motion is relative, uh, and that that's kind of key to uh, to this next video. So if I pull this up, um, what, I, what I should say uh, is that I, I I took this knowledge that the boat could sail downwind faster than the wind, um, and decided that that was counterintuitive and it, and it was interesting to me. And it, I thought it was the beginnings of the making of a good brain teaser. So I, I thought it was, as, as it stood, it was only a question. And it was a question, you know, can, can the sailboat make downwind headway faster than the wind um, could simply be answered. I wanted something that was a little bit more counterintuitive. So I decided to, to set out to have a way to make it go directly downwind faster than the wind um, because of of course, when it reaches wind speed, there's no wind over it. You know, when I'm sitting in the in that uh, Blackbird at wind speed, I could light a cigarette in the in the cockpit. You don't you feel absolutely no wind at all. And it's counterintuitive to a lot of folks that it would be possible for it to continue being powered by the wind at that time, and and it is, and to continue to accelerate. So I posed this brain teaser on a couple of forums. At the time, I was on a kite surfing forum and a and a radio control helicopter forum, and I posed it thinking that. Uh, you know, people would hopefully get it wrong because that's that's what you hope for with brain teasers. Um, and then I would explain how I imagined doing it and they would say, well, gee, that's clever. Um, but that's the opposite of what happened. They decided that uh, that I was an idiot, uh, which in large part is true. But in this particular case, I, I think I was right. Um, so we debated this uh, for a surprising, you know, for for actually for years um, before a buddy of mine that was involved in the debates said, you know, Rick, we have to build something. Analysis is, is really extremely simple. And I thought, look, it's just a few lines of, of math uh, that are very basic. But he did in fact convince me that we had to build something to demonstrate it. So we were silly enough to think that if we built a model uh, that we could put on a treadmill, and it advances on the treadmill, uh, that would demonstrate that it's possible and that would that would just put an end to it. So here's a, a quick video of, I've got a, a level sitting on the treadmill here, just to demonstrate that the, that the treadmill is in fact level. The belt is going from right to left, as you can hopefully see. And if we put the car on there, it goes the wrong way. Instead of falling off the back of the belt, like mo most things would, it advances on the forward on the belt. And this is where Galilean relativity is, comes into the picture because people will often say, well, that's just a treadmill powering the thing. That's, you know, the, the belt is turning the wheels and, and they're right, it is. 
Uh, but at the same time, it's identical to a cart out on the playa, on the dry lake. Because you can either move the, the ground or the surface underneath the vehicle, or you can move the, the air over the ground, and it's the same thing. You know, if, you, if that belt were big enough and wide enough and long enough, you could build houses and trees and, and roads and, and everything else on that belt. Um, and there'd be no telling that you were in fact on a moving belt rather than on a ground with a, a tailwind that, you know, in this case, the tailwind of course would be equivalent to the speed of the belt relative to the belt. So we built that little cart and demonstrated that. And by the way, that can, that can even go up a little bit of an incline. The faster the belt, uh, the, the better it does. At, at very low speed, it's, it's a little bit too, it's not efficient enough to succeed at, at very low speed. Um, but as I, you know, we, so we, we put that up and thought that would resolve it. And in fact, that just raised lots and lots of uh, arguments. And it, it turned into arguments in, in print, in lots of magazines, in lots of languages, on lots of forums, uh, you know, and then of course in the comment sections of our videos and so forth. And, and people, uh, people including physicists and aerodynamicists and you know professors of mechanical engineering and, and whatnot uh, just absolutely assured us that, that it was not possible. Um, and you know, I, I claim that there are three ways to know uh, that it is possible. I mentioned the, the vectors. This is the, uh, hopefully you all can still see my uh, desktop. Um, so this is the quick analysis that I mentioned that I did when, when I was asked whether it's possible. Um, and we don't have to get into great detail on this, but the, the notion here was that I just placed a boat um, at a 45 degree downwind uh, tack here. Um, and I put it at two times wind speed. So this is sort of hand of God, just placing it on, on the water at that speed. You can imagine that I, I tow it up to that speed or whatever I want. Uh, the question at that point for me was not whether or not we could achieve the speed, but whether if it were at that speed, it could be maintained. We could later address whether or not it could be could, could work its own way up to that speed. So in this case, I, I have the wind here, uh, you know, at, at wind speed. I've got the boat at two times wind speed on a 45 degree downwind tack. So I have my relative uh, airflow relative to the sail. And then I look at, we talked about lift and drag. So these would be the lift and drag vectors, which again are always relative to the, the flow. And the whole question here is whether this resultant force uh, of the lift and drag would normally have a forward component relative to the boat and its uh, direction. And it shows here that with a, a high enough L over D or lift to drag ratio, uh, it could do that. So this indicates that it's it's possible to uh, maintain a speed faster than the wind speed. By the way, at this at two times wind speed on this 45 degree downwind tack, I'm doing about 1.47 times wind speed in a downwind direction. So that's what I was sort of looking for: is can I have a downwind velocity component faster than the wind and maintain it? So this this tells me that that should be possible with a high enough performance. Um, Another way that we can know is by looking at the data from real sailboats. And like I say, nowadays with, um, maybe, maybe we go back to uh, camera here for a moment. So with, with um, sailboats now, America's Cup, it's common and you can just simply look at their data uh, from the races and see that they're doing quite a bit better than wind speed tacking downwind. Uh, so that's that's the second way of knowing. Um, and the third way, interestingly, is that it's pretty much been known for, for many, many years that sailboats can tack into the wind so they can make upwind uh, progress. And that sounds like a completely different thing until you realize that a sailboat really is effectively a, a bobber. Uh, sitting in the water with a wing sticking up in the air, which we call a sail, and a, another wing sticking down in the water, which we call a keel. So <clears throat> if you're tacking upwind uh, by Galilean invariance, you're also tacking down current faster than the current. You can imagine if you woke up on your sailboat in the middle of the ocean one morning and you go up on deck and you feel a 10 knot breeze, 
uh, you can decide, hey, I'm, I'm going to tack into that breeze. And you, and you do that. And then you later get home and look at the, at the weather charts and you find that there was in fact zero wind that day. So you conclude that what was happening is that you were simply drifting in a current. The, the 10 knot headwind you felt was not a real headwind. It was, it was a relative headwind uh, because of the current. So then you conclude that what was actually happening is you were being, uh, you were sailing down current faster than the current. And it's exactly the same vector analysis as, as the one I showed. You just turn the boat over and look at it from the fish's perspective instead of the sailor's perspective. Um, but none of those address uh, whether you can go directly downwind faster than the wind. The idea for the brain teaser that I posed is that I want to be able to go directly downwind faster than the wind. Um, so there's ways to, uh, to look at that. Let me, I'm going to go back into sharing again. So if I want to go uh, directly downwind faster than the wind, uh, something I can do is simply put my sailboat or sail cart inside of a frame on wheels. Uh, so the sailboat there is tacking downwind faster than the wind shown by the balloons. Of course, obviously this is just an animation, but it's, it's intended to um, illustrate that if I were to tack down wind like this, I could simply drag this cart along with me. The cart isn't doing anything other than acting as a, a, uh, an avatar, so to speak, for a vehicle that's going directly downwind. Um, and you might look at that and say, sure, that's, that's possible, but that's cheating. That's, that, too, is not really going downwind. I mean, you've, even the center of gravity is not going directly downwind. It's tacking. Uh, so to that, what I would say is we put two carts side by side in such a frame and we put them on alternate tacks. So now I've got something that is, you know, I've got these two vehicles inside the frame. The whole frame is going directly downwind. The, the vehicles are on alternate tacks. So the center of gravity is also going directly downwind now. And I, I do then have a directly downwind vehicle, uh, but that's not one that's uh, practical to build. Um, it's just intended to show that it's an engineering problem, not a, a theoretical problem. Um, and if you say, well, there still are moving parts, uh, my answer to that is that's true for everything. If you, you know, if I have even a, a line yacht has wheels on it and, and, you know, parts of the wheels are not going directly downwind, your car, when it's going in any direction at all has, you know, pistons and cotton rods and all sorts of stuff going in other directions, but you still say your car is going in a, in a given direction. But I did want to make a vehicle, uh, that was, uh, a bit more clever than that, I, I guess I'll say. So I kind of took a look at it this way. So I've got a similar thing. I've got my, this time I've got a boat uh, just going on a downwind tack. This is sort of my boat on the 45 degree downwind tack um, going at twice wind speed so that it's downwind component is faster than the wind. And instead of tacking back and forth, I'm just going to maintain that that tack at 45 degrees off wind. So we can see that from above. So now instead of tacking back and forth, uh, what I want to do is wrap that. Uh, I want to look at the world not as a globe or a sphere, but instead as a cylinder. So if I've got a boat going down this cylinder this way with the air going along the cylinder, I'll just spiral around the cylinder. I'll just follow a, a helical path down the cylinder faster than the wind. And I can imagine putting a, a second boat on that same cylinder. And what I have now is basically a propeller. So if I've got the propeller that's constrained to follow that same path, the way the boat is constrained by its keel, I can have the propeller constrained by a set of threads. I'll, I'll just pop, pop that up again real quick. So obviously, you know, scales change and so forth. I've got, I've made the cylinder smaller, the boat, the, the sail bigger and so forth. But as I put this second uh, boat on there, uh, I've, I've shown some threads along here. And in point of fact, if you actually did 
simply put a propeller on a shaft like this that is threaded with sufficiently coarse threads and with sufficiently low uh, losses, low, low resistance, a tailwind, a wind coming from, from the left uh, going to the right would mo motivate this propeller to beat the wind that's pushing it. And you say, well, the wind can't really push it per se um, because it's, it's outpacing the wind. Uh, and that's where the, the vector diagram comes in that I did before. The, of course, the sails are, or the, or the wings, the propeller blades in this case, are not going directly downwind. They maintain a continuous 45 degree downwind tack, uh, so to speak. So the fact that they are moving crosswind as well as downwind, even though they're going downwind faster than the wind, they're still getting a positive bite on the wind, so to speak, a positive bite on the air, and, and they're creating thrust. It's interesting that you normally would think of the sail of a sailboat as acting as, as a turbine of sorts. It's being pushed by the wind. Um, in this configuration, when, when, a, when a sailboat's sailing faster than the wind on a 45 degree downwind angle, the sail actually is acting as a propeller blade. It's actually producing thrust as this object would uh, right here. Um, So look, I want to look at this a, a few other ways. One of, one of my objectives is to try and, and make it intuitive to people how this is possible. Um, so there are some other analogies that we can use that hopefully are a little bit more intuitive than the vector diagrams, for example, that I've drawn. So this is a yo-yo that I made out of a, a block of wood. Uh, it's, it's, I mean, it's just simply you know, of course, yo-yo. I've got a couple of rubber bands around there to give it traction. I'm going to set it on the table, and you can see that the string is wound underneath the yo-yo. So my question to you now is, if I pull on that string, I'm going to pull it to the right, uh, and what will the yo-yo do when I pull that string? Um, so kind of take a, take a guess in your own mind as to what it'll do, and I'll let the video play, and we can take a look. So I pull it to the right, the yo-yo goes to the right, and it goes to the right faster than I'm pulling. It obviously takes up the string and, and hits me in the hand. Uh, so it's going a good bit faster than the force that's pulling it. Um, and the reason a lot of folks think that it should go the other way is that they imagine the any wheel or the yo-yo or something like this as being as rotating about its axis. Um, but that's not really accurate. That's that's kind of an intuition that we have. But a rolling wheel is actually pivoting about a point on the ground, the point of contact. At any instant, it's rotating about that point. So if you look at this yo-yo, uh, the string is uh, touching the yo-yo at some point above the ground. The pivot point is at the ground. So not only am I giving it a force to the right, I'm actually giving it a torque to the right at any instant. So it actually uh, goes around and, and winds up the string and the yo-yo goes faster than the wind. Now, this is sort of an interesting way to look at it. Um, this yo-yo shows the string at what I call the critical angle. If you look, uh, if you follow the string down here, it goes right through the point of contact. The force, go, uh, the force vector goes through the point of contact where the yo-yo and the ground um, are in contact. If I pull along this line, I will just drag the yo-yo. If I pull at a steeper angle, my torque, uh, you can see that you know my, my force will go through a point down here, for example, and that will apply a counterclockwise torque and the yo-yo will roll to the left. If I bring the line more horizontal, the force will go above the contact point and it will do as we saw uh, a moment ago. So I'm gonna, show a little video uh, demonstrating that. So same yo-yo, same idea. And now if I pull it from this high angle, it does in fact go away. If I pull it at a lower angle, it's going to roll toward me again. And I can find the critical angle where that force vector goes right through the point of contact. And in fact, it, you can see that it, it simply drags the yo-yo. But that's sort of the simplest vehicle that I can uh, think of that 
would demonstrate the principle of going directly downwind faster than the wind. Um, interestingly enough, you can do you can demonstrate this to yourself with a spool of wire, a yo-yo, or even a wine glass. If you lay a wine glass on its side and put your finger under the stem, uh, you can roll the roll the wine glass so that it'll come toward you or go away from you um, faster than your finger is moving. Um, so the yo-yo, of course, has a string, and you know that that's a little bit different than a steady state. Um, vehicle going downwind faster than the wind. So this is again the same yo-yo and what I'm going to try and demonstrate is if you can imagine this this rail that I use as the wind, um, it's the very same idea. Um, but you can imagine that, that that rail could be infinitely long and when I move it, uh, the yo-yo goes faster than the than the rail that's pushing it or faster than the wind if that were the wind. And the, you know the the gist of this is that I'm I'm pushing on a point that is going uh, in the same direction that I want it to go, but it's going slower than that. So if you if you ever grab a uh, a wheel by the spoke below the axle, uh, you'll have this very same effect. If you grab your bicycle wheel, for example, at, at by the by the spoke below the hub, the bike will move in the direction that you're pushing that but faster than you're pushing. Um, to take that one a step further, um, you can imagine that, oh, that's not what I wanna pull up. This is what I wanna pull up. So this is a, uh, an example of sort of that same yo-yo, but instead of uh, running it on a rail or uh, having a string, I put a bunch of paddles on there. So you can imagine a trough of water where all of these paddles are, are dipped down into that trough of moving water and the wheels are beside the trough. Uh, so this simple vehicle that has no moving parts at all, if I, if I set this in that trough of water and I've got the trough of, I've got the water moving at say, you know, five knots from left to right. Um, and the water say is up to halfway up the, the spoke on these paddles, this thing is going to roll at twice that, twice the speed of the water, and it will do that indefinitely. Um, I'm gonna take another, uh, another description. You can imagine, so in, in the cart that, that I built, um, what we decided was that we simply had to do the same thing as the two sailboats on a, um, on a cylindrical earth. I'm gonna to try to get back here to, to unsharing screen. So what we had to do is, is basically replicate what those two sailboats were doing on the cylinder. Uh, so what I do there is I have a propeller that is uh, geared to the wheels of the vehicle such that when the vehicle goes downwind by, you know, one unit, the propeller will rotate by a, a given amount so that the tips of the propeller would be the same as those sails on the sailboat. They would have to follow a 45 degree downwind path because of the gearing between the, the wheels and the, and the propeller. And in this case, it's important to know that the, the well, A, the, the wheels and the transmission simply provide exactly the same constraint that the keel would on the sailboat. Um, you're, you're going to keep the tips of that on a continuous downwind 45 degree tack. Um, so we built the Blackbird to do that. And it's interesting to note that the wheels are always turning the propeller. The propeller never turns the wheels. The, um, a, lot, a lot of folks uh, ha imagine that a couple of things that initially perhaps the wind uh, is pushing on the whole thing and, and it is simply pushing on the whole thing as a bluff body, but that as you approach wind speed, uh, you have to have some kind of change of mode or change of phase or something like this. And interestingly, that really doesn't happen. The, at all times, the wheels are turning the propeller and the propeller is begins generating thrust. The 
the tips of the blades um, initially start, you know, when they get moving fast enough by simply being blown down when there's a buff body and being turned by the wheels, they develop attached flow. So you start getting normal airflow over the tips and they then start to develop lift, which of course for a propeller is thrust. Um, and as you continue to pick up speed, that attached flow develops further toward the root of the propeller and you become more and more efficient. When you reach wind speed, there is no relative flow over the vehicle. Uh, but if you think about it, that's also true for a Cessna sitting on the tarmac with its engine running. I mean, the way it starts moving is it turns its propeller and it can start to taxi. And that's what's happening with this as well. There's no movement of the air relative to the vehicle, but there is still movement of the air relative to the ground. And we're exploiting that by having this uh, contraption that's trapped between the ground and the air so that the wheels turn the propeller, the propeller generates thrust and I can, I can go downwind. So even at wind speed, when I feel no wind at all, um, I can maintain that speed forever. And you can demonstrate that on a, a number of ways. You can demonstrate that on a treadmill, on an incline, or I've got uh, videos with a treadmill where we're, we're holding the vehicle back. Um, we've got it tied, we've got it tethered so that you can see that it will simply pull on those tethers indefinitely. So the thing can go uphill, uh, it can pull a trailer it, at, at exactly wind speed. There's nothing about wind speed that changes the mode. You don't have to gain momentum and work your way through wind speed. We don't, not only do we not use any stored energy, we cannot use any stored energy to accelerate. Um, we've put a ratchet on the axle so that the wheels can turn the propeller, but the propeller cannot turn the wheels. It will freewheel if the propeller tries to turn the wheels. Uh, and that was one of the requirements for the record attempt was that it had to, we had to demonstrate a couple of things that it was A, going faster than the wind, B, was accelerating uh, through the period that was up for the record so that we couldn't have the possibility that, you know, the wind was going 30 miles an hour, it got us up to 29 miles an hour, then the wind drops to 15 and we go, look, we're going 30 and a 15 because we would necessarily be decelerating if the wind dropped. Um, unless we were doing as, as we claim, actually achieving faster than the wind steady state. So the ratchet on the wheels does prevent us from uh, using any stored energy. If And even without the ratchet, you, you think that, well, you've got energy stored in the rotating prop and so forth. But to use that energy, by definition, you have to allow the prop to slow down. That's how you would get the energy out of a rotating body. And if the prop slows down, it necessarily slows down the wheels. So you cannot accelerate above wind speed, um, even using stored energy in that way. But again, in addition to that, we have the ratchet. Uh, additionally, if you look at our data, and I don't know if you, maybe some of you guys have seen the Veritasium videos, but on one of them, uh, Derek shows our data from our record run, where we're going 2.8 times wind speed. There's no gust at any time that approaches our speed. You know, the wind is sort of roughly tw uh, 10 miles an hour and we're going 28 miles an hour. Uh, so it, it kind of rules out the possibility that we're just coasting on a, on, a, on a higher gust or into a lull or something like that. Uh, so I want to try to throw one last, actually, I want to, I guess I'll touch on two things real quick. I want to throw out one more analogy that hopefully will make this a little bit more obvious. Um, and, you know, something we've certainly found is that of the dozen or so analogies that we come up with, um, it's always the last one that works for people. And they say, well, why did you waste my time with vectors and yo-yos and stuff like this when, you know, this obviously is how it works. But unfortunately it's everyone clicks on, on a different one if they click on any of them at all. So what I want to do is imagine a, uh, a blackbird uh, inside of a, an enormous giant block of jello. Uh, so what I'm gonna do is just push that giant block of jello along the ground with the blackbird inside it. And the, you know, still the propeller can turn in that jello and the wheels can turn, but the wheels are still in contact with the ground. So when I push the jello along the ground, it's going to turn the wheels and that's going to turn the prop. And what I'm going to do is gear the prop really, really low so that I can go a thousand yards um, or we'll, we'll do it for you guys. We'll go a thousand meters. So we'll go a thousand meters down jello as it were. And the prop will make only one single rotation at a time, just because I gear it really low. And at the same time, I'll have a really low pitch 
on the blades of the uh, propeller so that in one rotation, I would only advance one meter. So I've gone a thousand meters. Um, I've been pushed by the jello a thousand meters along the ground. Um, and in that thousand meters, I'm going to have one rotation of my propeller, and that propeller is going to try to advance me one meter through the jello. So what you can see is basically a giant block of jello that's been pushed a thousand meters along the ground, and a vehicle that's gone a thousand and one meters along the ground. It's gone in the thousand meters being trapped in the jello plus the meter that it advanced through the jello because the, the propeller is sort of screwing its way through and it advancing in the jello by one more meter. And incidentally, going, you know, we don't want to use jello uh, in real life, but but air is not that different from jello. Air is a viscous fluid. Um, it's for some folks, I think it's easier to picture this with jello than with air. Um, it's kind of easier to recognize that you don't necessarily have to be pushed from behind. You are immersed in the flow at all times. Going faster than the jello doesn't mean that I'm not still in the jello and can advance in it. And that's true of the air as well. Um, so for some people, that analogy uh, is a little easier. Let me pull up um, a power analysis that I think, and, and this will be the final analysis before we just go to some questions. But this is the analysis, which um, I claim is actually a very simple analysis um, that shows how this is working. Again, I'm gonna do what I did with the um, the boat where I just place it at, um, at, a, at a speed and see if I can maintain it. So in this particular case, what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna tow the Blackbird uh, up to speed. And in fact, I, I've gone with feet per second here. So my my apologies um, hey, Rick, on that. you're not but, sharing your screen right now. Well, there's that. Okay, let's try that then. By the way, the, the sharing the screen now is going to be pretty uninteresting, um, but I'll, I, I will share it. Let's get back to my document. Okay, so this is just a, a very simple power analysis. Um, and like I say, I'm, I'm just going to tow the Blackbird up to 30 feet per second. And I'm going to do that in a 25 uh, foot per second tailwind. So I'm, I'm towing it up to a speed faster than the wind, and that is clearly cheating. But uh, I want to see then if I do that, what will be the tension in my tow rope? So what I do is I'm going to put a, a generator on board the Blackbird, and I'm going to set the, the power output of that generator such that I'm putting 100 pounds of drag on the wheels. The wheels are turning this generator, and they're producing 100 pounds of drag um, by turning the generator. So that tells me that now if I had, you know, if I had no friction from anything else, I now have 100 pounds of tension in my tow rope. Um, so the power that I'm producing in the generator is going to be that the 30 feet per second that I'm towing it times 100 pounds of tension, or 300 uh, foot pound per second of power that I generate. So I get about five and a half horsepower at the cost of towing this thing at 100 pounds of force. But I'm going to say my generator is only 80% efficient. And that's a, a, a sort of a reasonable number to achieve with a generator. So my 3,000 pound foot per second, uh, I only get 2,400 pound feet per second output from that generator. And I'm going to use that energy to drive my propeller. Um, and I'm going to do that by hooking that generator up to an electric motor. So now I'm going to say my electric motor is also only 80% efficient because electric motors also are not 100% efficient. So the 3,000 pound foot per second became 2,400 pound foot per second out of the generator. I'm only going to get uh, 1920 pound feet per second out of my electric motor to turn my propeller. And now I'm going to make my propeller 80% efficient as well. So it can only produce 80% it can only produce thrust times velocity, which is the work the propeller does at 80% of the energy I put into it. So now my 3000 pounds is all the way down to 1,536 pound feet per second of work that I can do on the air. And this is where everything gets really interesting. The work I do on the air is the thrust I produce, the force times the distance or the power force times speed. Now, what's interesting is I said, I'm going 30, feet per second over the ground, but I'm only going five feet per second through the air. I have a 25 foot per second tailwind, 
and I'm going 30 feet per second. So I'm only advancing five feet per second through the air. So if I take my 1,536 pound feet per second that the prop can produce at five feet per second through the air, I'll figure my thrust. My thrust here turns out to be 307 pounds, which is 207 pounds in excess of the thrust that it took uh, to tow the thing. So that 207 pounds, um, I'm sorry, that actually that, I think that already accounted. Yeah, the 207 pounds is after the, the, the force of driving the generator. So the question is then only can I overcome my rolling resistance and my aerodynamic drag uh, with this excess of 207 pounds of thrust? Uh, and the answer is, is clearly, uh, yeah, that we, we can. And, you know, I've got some, some real world numbers um, that if the cart is 600 pounds, uh, which is about what it is, it's about 450 pounds plus my uh, own weight of a couple hundred pounds at 1% of rolling resistance, I've only got six pounds of rolling resistance um, with a 10 foot square foot uh, frontal area and a coefficient of drag of about 0.3 moving at uh, half or rather five feet per second. I've only got another, you know, less than a 10th of a pound of aerodynamic drag. So I still have 200 pounds of excess thrust, meaning that I, I have no tension in the tow rope. I, you know, uh, I'll cut the tow rope and I will pass the, the chase vehicle. And in fact, uh, we have videos where we've done essentially exactly that. What we've actually done is uh, pushed the vehicle up to speed with the chase vehicle. As soon as we reach wind speed, we maintain speed in the chase vehicle, uh, and the uh, the Blackbird pulls away from it, and you know then the chase vehicle comes up and, and catches it. Um, so anyway, I think I've I've kind of hit my my time, um, and we can jump into questions if people have any. Let me try to get back to uh, video. Thanks. Okay. Rebecca. That was really good. Um, I think we've got a hand up already, actually. Um, oh, I, yeah. Uh, Aurelian, is that correct? Put your hand up. Go ahead and unmute. Do you hear me? Yeah, yes, I do. Go ahead. Great, great. Um, I was just wondering how you traded off for your propeller. Um, how did you trade off between the pitch angle and the right angle to go um, downwind? Ah, that is, the, that is the key question. That is the best question. So it turns out that you characterize this vehicle almost entirely on something that we call the vehicle speed ratio. And what that is, is the ratio of speed that, that the propeller is trying to advance through the air divided by the speed that the wheels are trying to advance over the ground. So we have two things impact, well, we sort of have three things impacting that. The size, the, the diameter of the wheel, the uh, gear ratio between the axle and the propeller and the pitch of the propeller. If that ratio is below one, so I'm trying to advance through the air more slowly than I'm trying to advance over the ground, I get a vehicle that will go downwind faster than the wind. If that ratio is above one, I get a vehicle that's trying to go directly upwind. So if all I do is remove the ratchet so that the propeller can now turn the wheel and I reduce that ratio by either reducing the gearing or the blade pitch, um, I end up with a vehicle that goes upwind. And we actually did that very thing. We set the upwind record at 2.1 times wind speed. Um, I actually replaced the rotors, uh, I replaced the propeller rotor blades with turbine rotor blades, because as I mentioned, in this case, the wheels are always turning the propeller, the wind is not. In the upwind case, the rotor, which is now a turbine, is turning the wheels. And interestingly enough, if you think about the thing sitting uh, stationary in the, in the tailwind, what's happening is the tailwind is trying to turn that propeller counterclockwise. It's also trying to push the whole thing downwind as a bluff body. And that means that the wheels are going to try to turn it clockwise. By having that blade pitch low enough, the wheels are going to end uh, are going to win the battle between the wheels and the wind trying to turn it so the wheels turn the prop if i increase that blade pitch enough the wind wins that battle and it turns the wheels the other way and it goes upwind so interestingly enough the the design speed uh, i'll call it uh is defined by that same ratio 
the closer I get to 1.0 in that ratio, the faster my design speed. So I can approach an infinite multiple of wind speed as I bring that ratio closer and closer to 1.0. If I bring it from below, I get a vehicle that's trying to go infinitely fast relative to the wind downwind. And if I bring it toward one from above, I get a vehicle that wants to go upwind at infinite times wind speed. So it's very easy to design a, a craft that's designed to go essentially infinite or any multiple of wind speed. It's very hard to make one that will actually work because as I get closer to one, the necessary efficiency, remember in, in my power analysis, I showed a lot of losses between you know, the generator, you know, the transmission, the propeller, the motor. Um, the more I bring that ratio toward one, the lower losses can be tolerated. And in fact, we can define the, the overall speed in terms of just vehicle, the overall efficiency as well. Um, so to answer your question, I had, I, I picked a number um, and the way we did a lot of this is you, you, you pull a number out of your head um, and you give it a try and then you tweak it. Um, so I picked a number that was lower than one, but high enough that we would get some reasonable uh, multiple above wind speed in a downwind direction. We did, you know, I did some simulations and analysis to figure out that I thought I could achieve an efficiency that would allow me to get in the ballpark of, of three times wind speed. Um, and in fact, I'm pretty sure that we have done three times wind speed or better. But for the record runs, there are a, a whole bunch of constraints that you have to meet simultaneously. Uh, so the best record run that we have that qualified in all manners was 2.8 times wind speed. But there were times that uh, I'm pretty confident that we were doing a little better than than three times wind speed. Um, does does that? I hope that addresses the question. That's it. Thank you. Certainly. Um. Norman actually just put in a link to um, one of the YouTube videos you mentioned earlier um, with uh, Veritasium. Um, it's actually yeah. a video I watched when I found out about you. I watched the whole thing. I thought it was amazing. Um, so yeah, if anyone was interested, the the links in the chat. Um, I'm curious. Is that is that the the first video he did, or because he did one on the on the downwind vehicle, uh, and then he it, it turns out maybe some of you know that a professor from UCLA bet him ten thousand dollars that it was not possible um and and you know the professor lost that bet and he made a second video addressing the bet which i thought was a, actually a very good video um and it yeah yeah you know, this one's the, the, life, the successful physics debate which i think is the first one um yeah norman's put the second one on, on as well uh but yeah that that bet was actually quite impressive um oh, so I, should, ask. I should point out by the way that in the first one um i think he titled it risking my life to to prove something in physics um and a lot of people are are ridiculing him for thinking he's risking his life uh at five miles an hour on on a dry lake um but you might notice if you look at the video that the thing is trying to shake itself to pieces and the reason for that is um, I haven't, you know, I, I was actually forced to sell the vehicle because I had nowhere to keep it. Um, so I sold it to a guy that lives in Santa Barbara. Uh, I hadn't seen the video in, uh, uh, rather the vehicle in more than 10 years. Uh, so in that time, the propeller blade pitches had gotten out of alignment so that they were uneven. And the uneven uh, thrust from the two blades is just absolutely going into resonance and trying to tear the thing apart. Now, the other thing that's worth knowing is that that whole pylon and blades and all that folds downward um, and basically puts the, the spinner and prop right where the driver sits uh, for transport. So when we put it on trailer, that's how we, we travel. So that, you know, this whole thing is homemade, uh, you know, from duct tape and fiberglass and, and crap like this. And he's sitting in that, thinking that whole thing's going to land right on my head. And, you know, as the designer and builder, I was thinking, you know, that whole thing's going to land right on his head. Uh, so that's, that was where he was risking his life. Not, it wasn't the speed of, you know, falling out of the vehicle going 10 miles an hour. Well, Rick, you might also recall when you first uh, tried uh, flying or sailing uh, Blackbird, it almost flipped over and killed you too. It did. It did. So that's another thing that's interesting to note that if you if you look on the video, you'll see that the left axle is longer than the right axle. Um, and that's because we ended up operating in, in a little more wind at times than than I anticipated. And the torque 
uh, from the propeller was sufficient that it was starting to lift the right wheel off the ground. Um, and, you know, I'm sitting on a, uh, a sort of a hammock that I just wove out of uh, some kite surfing line. Um, so I'm not, you know, no seatbelts or anything like that. I, I really didn't want this thing to turn over and, and grind my head off. So we extended the left axle further. And then when we went for the upwind record, I turned, I made the blades opposite so that it rotates the opposite direction rather than making the opposite axle longer. <clears throat> we just had to turn the opposite direction so that we still could take advantage of that extended left axle to keep it from turning over. <clears throat> uh, Jamie Chapman. Yeah, hi. Um I was wondering if there were some kind of real world examples that use this idea that you could tell us. You know, it's not... in it. Oh, sorry. It, it's a very interesting question. Um, you know, in, in, in some ways, I would say every time a boat tacks up wind, it, it does. Um, you know, it, it, it's sort of backwards and inside out, but it's, it's actually doing exactly the same thing. But a more interesting example, I would say, is uh, if you look at the, the cart, you'll see there's a, a Joby uh, uh, logo on there. Joby Energy is an outfit that was uh, going to put a they, they designed an enormous aircraft that would be tethered to the ground and would have a whole bunch of props. Uh, in fact, this would be the biggest aircraft ever built. Uh, and it was to be tethered on a 30,000 foot tether um, and capture wind energy and transmit that to the ground over that cable. You can imagine that's a, a pretty tough task. Well, uh, as it happens, just by purely by chance, this is a guy that um, was a friend of a friend. So we contacted him to say, hey, would you be interested in sponsoring our little idea here of a downwind craft? And surprisingly, so I had actually contacted Google first. Um, Google said, we'll get back to you. And I contacted uh, Joe Ben of Joby and he immediately said, yes. Uh, I mean, I, I didn't get through three sentences before he said yes. Well, his aircraft is designed to essentially take advantage of the same thing. By, by tethering that aircraft, if you simply fly it on the tether, it's, it's not doing anything special. But if you start doing things like flying a figure eight or a loop on that tether, you're, you're taking advantage of the very same principle. You're, so you're actually, if you look at uh, a, a windmill, a windmill is subject to what's called the Betts limit. You can only capture about 59% of the energy of the wind that's flowing through the rotor. And there's two reasons for that. One is that you, you can't stop the wind, right? You can't take it through the rotor and have it stop on the other side to zero. So some energy has to remain in, in the air that's passed through. The other reason is the capture area of the rotor. There's a high pressure zone, of course, on the on the upwind side of the rotor and, and low on the downwind. Well, that upwind pressure side means some of the air that's headed toward the rotor is actually going to end up being uh, pushed outside around the tips of the rotor, not affected by the rotor. So this bet li bets limit only it permits you to gain about 59% theoretical maximum from uh, a turbine. With this approach, you can effectively not only do better than 59%, you can do more than 100%. You can, you can get several hundred percent of effective efficiency. And I say effective because I mean, Relative to the true wind speed, you can you can get much more energy out than that than that would suggest for the area of your rotor times the the wind speed, and that's because you're moving through the wind as well. Your the, the relative wind speed that is being felt um, is is significantly higher than the true wind speed. Another way to to kind of look at that, and, and one way I sort of imagine that is if the if the Blackbird were a lawnmower and the lawn, the, the grass was the fuel. Well, if I'm moving along through the grass, back loop, it's a it's an open loop. It's the, the energy is coming from the outside. But the faster I go over that grass, the more grass I get to burn and and take advantage of. There there was also, you know, we we talked about uh, I was invited to speak about this at uh, a Google Science conference. Um, and Interestingly, Larry Page uh, suggested something that we had also talked about, which is you guys may have seen that people are talking about putting giant kites, like kite surfing kites on ships to assist them in open ocean uh, crossings. 
this would probably be a better way to do that. This is a much easier thing to manage. You know, kite serving uh, is is great for a lot of things, but boy, I got to tell you, the very last thing you want to do is have a kite the size of three football fields in the water to deal with on on your ocean going vessel. Um, it's really easy in this case to either feather the blades or even um, essentially detach the blades. Um, when we were out on the playa the first time, just doing a demonstration run for the North American Land Sailing Association, uh, big, a big gust came up and all of the guys uh, with all their land sailors went into a panic and you know the wind just really built quickly and they all started running over to their yachts and turning them up on side so that the sail was lying on the ground um, so that they wouldn't you know, get blown away and tear themselves apart. And with this vehicle, all we did is just turned it sideways to the wind and it just sat there. Um, so it's, it's really much easier to deal with in, in big winds. So you, you could do that. And from you know, my rough calculations, you could probably save seven to 10% of your fuel costs for you know, uh, an oil tanker, for example, going across the, the ocean. Um, if somebody wanted to s sort of spend the, the time and effort to do that. I think we, we've hit our official time limit. I'm more than happy to, uh, to hang on, but um, that's all I got. Nice, yeah. Um, I don't know if anyone else has got any more questions, but um, yeah, that, that was really good. Um, that yo-yo thing, to be honest, blew my mind, and that was step one. Um, well, I have, to, I have to know, were you, so normally, and I have to apologize because I've never done this remotely, so I am by no means got this worked out. Um, normally I have a screen, you know, on one side of me and I can just sort of point at it. Um, and I normally ask folks uh, to, to take a vote on what the yo-yo is going to do. So what, what was your vote? Did you think it would go the other way? Yeah, I thought it would unravel mm -hmm. backwards. Yeah. yeah, I think that's, that's, the, that's certainly the common, that's the common uh, intuitive assumption about that. And it is interesting that it, it rolls itself up. To me, one of the interesting things about that is as soon as you see a yo-yo do that, you kind of go, okay, it's just the whole thing's just an engineering problem. There shouldn't be any theoretical problem with going faster than, than the thing that's pulling you. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, no, it's crazy. <laughs> that was a really good, good presentation, though. Thank you, Rick. Um, yeah, I guess we can wrap up if... Oh, we've got round of applause. Okay, nice. <laughs> I'm sorry. Thank you so much, Rick. Certainly, certainly. Thank you. And uh, again, I'm 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 sorry for the sort of the rough approach to trying to do this online, but uh, maybe I'll improve. No, that was really good. I've I've followed it. Yeah. Yeah. And thank you for everyone who came and listened. Um, it was thank you for coming. Definitely. Yeah. Great. Thanks, um, everybody. Thank you. Good night. Thanks. You stop recording. Oh, yeah. <laughs> I'll do that. Uh, okay. <laughs>